Cool. So thank you everyone for you know making time uh, out of your day uh, to attend this workshop. Uh, we'll be uh, talking about fission, of course, as you know, as you might have registered already, uh, which is the fast framework on top of Kubernetes. Now, very briefly about myself. My name is Vishal. Uh, I'm CTO and founder of InfraCloud Technologies. And I'm one of the fission maintainers, uh, but I also run Pune Kubernetes Meetup for quite a while. And you can connect me on you know LinkedIn or Twitter and, and yeah, other places basically. So before we go into the uh, actual workshop, uh, you know, why don't all of us introduce ourselves, uh, talk about you know our background uh, in Docker, KTS, and then you know uh, your interest in learning fission. Can we go on the table quickly? So maybe uh, yeah, let's start with Nikhil. Cool. So hey guys, I'm Nikhil Shrivastav, and I'm originally from Nepal, but I've been staying in Bangalore for past eight years now. So I did my college here and. Um, I joined a local startup from here and right now I'm working at a different startup based in US. So what we work with is we work with political campaigns in the US who are running for Senate or city councils or some other races to help them with gathering voter data and helping them mobilize supporters. So basically helping them with surveys, donations or whatever their needs are. So we have built tools for them. So everything works with our underlying data infrastructure. And so I'm a full stack developer and I also do DevOps at our current team. So we have um, five developers who work in the backend and DevOps. And so my interest in learning fission is because we have been looking to migrate our admin application to our own. Inf we already have a production Kubernetes cluster. So we want to have serverless APIs running in the same one. So we came across open fast and fission. So we had an interest in that. And that's why we thought of um, trying it out. Yeah, that's about me. Well, Ganesh, you want to go next? Okay, hi everyone. My name is Ganesh and I'm from Pune. So I started as an intern four years ago at Red Hat itself. And currently I'm working as a technical support engineer, primarily uh, on OpenStack, Red Hat OpenStack basically. So uh, I would like to uh, switch my profile to DevOps uh, very soon. So currently I'm into learning phase, to be honest. Uh, so I would rate myself as an intermediate in uh, Docker and Kubernetes. And Fission, uh, I would like to explore more about Fission uh, and the serverless, serverless functions. So yeah, I'm here to learn more about it. Great, great. Uh, Gurish, you want to go next? Uh, yeah, hi all. Uh, this is Giri Salvaker. I am working with uh, uh, IBM on uh, on open source tools. So we work on porting uh, various open source uh, tools on uh, a Z platform. Um, so I've been working with uh, adding Kubernetes support on Z for last uh, four years. So I worked on various uh, tools uh, on Kubernetes, namely Kubernetes Istio, uh, then OpenWhisk. Yes, uh, that's it. And the uh, reason uh, joining this program is to know more about Vision, what is the case, Vision, and uh, what are its functionalities and all. Got it, got it. Uh, how do I pronounce your name? Uh, is it Girish? It's Girish. Girish. It's oh. Girish. Yeah. yeah. The, the U in between confused me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. Gaurav, you want to go next? Yep. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Gaurav. I'm working as a developer advocate with InfraCloud, and which I'm working with Vishal as well. I'm here to bridge my gap with Fission so that uh, I understand the system inside out. And uh, outside work, I'm a Docker community leader. And uh, like Vishal, uh, I co-organize multiple meetup groups in Pune. Cool, cool, cool. Sounds good. Uh, I was just checking if anybody else is joining, or I think it is just all of us. So yeah, we'll start anyways. I think it's only 15 minutes past the uh, start time. Cool. So table of functions and not contents, as you can imagine, the pun of functions uh, there. So we'll talk about, you know, uh, first of all, understand some basic concepts, you know, in context of fission, what is the environment? What is a function? What is a package? What is a trigger and stuff like that, right? And towards the end of it, we'll get some sense of, you know, what fission concepts are, and then we'll slightly cover like a very brief overview of architecture and some of the internals of, you know, environment that you need to understand before you kind of go further. We'll then go to scheduling and exe execution strategies. And I think there is a lot of, uh, you know, kind of important areas here, which are very different compared to, let's say, other uh, platforms. 
and and we'll talk about you know a couple of those in detail. Uh, then we'll go and you know talk about uh, event sources and sinks, and uh, you know what do they mean, how it is built out in fission, and and then next we'll talk about fission specs, CI/CD, and you know a bunch of other areas. Now till this point in time in the workshop, we'll be doing some hands-on, but it'll be a little lighter you know till this point in time. In the next section, which is putting it all together in hands-on demo, uh, you know we will actually get super detailed. We have like four or five hour demos that we will end up you know working on. And, and based on time and stuff, you know, we can adjust the piece, of course. Next, we'll talk about contributing to fission. Uh, you know, and there are multiple avenues to contribute in fission, not just the fission code, uh, but there are you know, a lot of interesting areas. And then finally, we'll talk about advanced areas like workflows or multi-tenancy. Uh, we'll talk about a couple of customer use cases. We'll talk about how they scaled out fission, you know, in production environments and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's that's a very you know brief of the what we are going to cover today. So let's uh, you know get the basics right. I, I hope all of you do have a Kubernetes cluster ready, uh, either kind or you know GKE, CO, whatever you have, you know equivalent basically. Uh, I and I hope you also have Fission installed. Uh, on my current setup, I got the latest release, which is 1.13.1, which just came out last week. Uh, but you can also use anything you know 1.12.0 or later sort of. Uh, and I'm assuming definitely you have kubectl and Fission installed. So if not, you know just good to verify that you have Fission installed. And the CLI install, of course. Uh, quick check will be also to check your fission namespace has a bunch of pods running. You might see some more pods if you have enabled Prometheus there, but otherwise, you know, this is this is what that uh, looks like. And of course, uh, some sort of you know ID. Uh, VS Code is what I'm using, but you can use whatever you know works for you basically. Cool. So uh, just making sure all of us are set up with with the prerequisites, or do we need any help in that? Good. Okay. I'm, I'm assuming we are good. Cool. Great. All right. So let's start with some basic, you know, components or or uh, basic understanding of concepts in fission. So before I go there, right? How many uh, of you have worked with custom resources and uh, understand what a custom resource is in the context of Kubernetes? Nikhil, Ganesh, Girish. Um, I have never worked with custom resources. I have worked with custom resources, but not extensively. Got it, got it. I haven't worked yet. Got it. I just know the basics. Not, not soft. Great, great, perfect, perfect, cool. So accordingly, I'll, I'll try to you know uh, message the concepts because uh, if you knew CR, I would probably talk a little differently, assuming you know like CRs and stuff, but that's cool. Cool. Uh, Vishal, I, before you start, I have a question sure. actually. Uh, yep. After the session, is the recording available? Yes, we are recording. Uh, okay. I believe it should definitely be available to the attendees okay. and probably eventually to to slightly larger uh, audience as well. But I, I'll check with, uh, but you definitely should get access to recording. Sure, so, sure. cool, thanks. Cool, so uh, Fission is a fast and simple, uh, you know, function framework for Kubernetes. Uh, it, it is built on top of Kubernetes and CRs and, you know, controllers is what it is basically built of. Uh, now, one thing it allows you to do is only write the code and not worry about like an image or Kubernetes manifest and stuff like that. They are abstracted from you to the extent you want. It is not that they're completely abstracted from you. If you want to still play around with them, you can do that. But if you don't want to play around with them, you can still stay abstracted and still write code and run functions on Kubernetes. Uh, we promise a 100 millisecond cold start uh, in, in, you know, especially like a warm pool scenario. We'll talk about warm pool slightly later in the in the workshop. You can also build your code in the cluster and you don't have to do it locally. And it does support integration with quite a few event sources. Uh, we'll talk about that again, you know, definitely in detail. And there is support for tolerations, volume, security context, you know, a bunch of other Kubernetes features that we'll talk about again uh, later for sure. So if I have to, you know, kind of briefly describe, so let me go from left-hand side of the diagram to the right-hand side of the diagram, right? So Fission does support more or less all the major languages, right? From Java, Go, Node, Ruby, PHP, to even Perl, you know, and .NET, for example, right? Secondly, it allows you to not just write functions, but also kind of deploy microservices. And, and it allows you to not just give you the code to Fission, you can also give it a Docker image, right? So based on your reference and how comfortable you are or how detailed you want to get into, you know, the system, you can decide, I just want to write the function code and not worry about Docker files or Kubernetes manifest. Or you can say, hey, I already have a Docker image. Simply run it for me, right? So all the kind of formats are supported by Fission. Now, once you deploy this to Fission, you obviously want to call that function or microservice you know, some way or the other, right? 
So HTTP is one way, of course. And within HTTP, when I say HTTP, it's a broader, uh, you know, kind of umbrella term. You're talking about web sockets, potentially gRPC in future, but all those things are supported for you to call functions. Am I still? Am I still audible? Yes, for sure. Yep. Okay. Am I audible now? Yep. Okay. Something happened with the audio. It disconnected and then connected again. Cool. So yeah, I was just saying the broad HTTP uh, umbrella, you know, is is one of the ways you can call it. The other ways you can call functions is using cron. So you can say, you know, every X minutes, every X hours, you know, what does that frequency looks like? And, and you know, those uh, ways functions can be called. The last part, and which is probably, you know, probably one of the majority parts is the message queues or data sources, as I would like to call them, right? Because uh, nowadays it's not just about message queues, it's also about data sources, any change in them invoking a function and stuff like that, right? So for message queue integration, we use a framework called Keda. It's an open source project. Uh, and uh, we have written, you know, a layer on top of that and, you know, enable some of the, uh, integrations in an easier way, you know, using Keda as underlying technology. And with Keda, uh, it supports a whole bunch of, uh, you know, integrations. So as of today, we do support like Kafka, we do support uh, NATS, we do support Amazon Kinesis, SQS, uh, and then there is Azure, uh, you know, it's coming soon, GCP, Pop Service supported. So there are about six or seven ads supported today. There are more that needs to be added. And that's, you know, one of the areas, you know, where folks can contribute and I'll come to that. That is one of the easiest areas to get started in terms of open source contribution, right? And since you have a platform like this, you definitely want solid observability in place. So we do support and integrate with Elastic, Prometheus, Yager, Grafana, you know, all, all the major ones. And uh, we are also piloting a few, you know, additional and interesting uh, tracing platforms uh, beyond Yeager as well. Uh, so that's that's like a basic overview of Fission. Cool, so that's the basic system. Uh, we'll look at the architecture and other components in, in definitely in more detail, right, later. So let's start with, first of all, uh, okay, before we go there, if you are, you know, on GitHub, uh, I would appreciate if you can go and star, you know, uh, us and, and of course other repositories and fissions, you know, sub organization. And uh, yeah, and you can find us on Slack and stuff. Uh, the documentation is on docs.fission.io and then there's a blog. And fission.io has a community tab which you can find how to join Slack and all that stuff, basically. Cool, so that's, that's uh, sort of the basics, you know, of fission so far. Cool, so first of all, let's talk about environment, right? So environment is what uh, I would think of, if you are to think of like the olden days, you know, when you had a VM and then you used to run a program on it, right? So VM is like an environment on which you're running, right? You would say, I want Ubuntu XYZ, I want Apache to be running on that, you know, some basic things as, like a contract for you basically, right? So think of a fission environment as an equivalent of that, where you have the OS and runtime, right? And you could say, I want Alpine, I want Ubuntu, whatever you want basically, right? And you have some basic dependencies already available to you, and that's basically the environment. And in, in the context of a language, uh, you could have one environment for Golang, you could have another for Python, or even within Python, you could say I have one you know, Python environment for data science kind of world, and then I have another Python environment which only runs a web server, a simple web server, basically, right? So, so basically the OS runtime and some basic dependencies is what environment is in context of fission. Important point to note here, there is no user or function code yet here, right? So environment is only a basic level section uh, where you can say, I get this basic runtime and these dependencies available and we'll, we'll add you know, stuff on top of that basically, right? So that is the environment as a basic concept. Now, if I do take examples of environment, right? Look, if you look at the Node.js environment, which is right now available in Fission, it has a Node.js Alpine as the core basic image. And it has a few dependencies built in, like Express, uh, there is code, there is request, and there's request form is native as well, right? So that, that was, that's what forms basically the Node.js environment. Similarly, okay, there is a typo here. Uh, it should be Go here. Uh, it's a, if you look at the Go environment, it basically gives you a simple Ubuntu 18.04, and it has a Go server running on top of that. Simple vanilla, you know, Go server using Mux, nothing, nothing complicated. So those are like some of the environment examples. We'll go look at the code uh, shortly or you know, at some logical point, basically, right? So once you have environment, uh, let's go ahead and create an environment, right? So uh, you can follow along you know, on this one with me uh, so that you know, we are up to the speed and you know, when, when we actually test out things, we can actually uh, try them out as well. Right? So what I suggest is uh, open up your terminals and copy this command. Uh, you can find it on the slides, but if, uh, you also copy the fission examples repo 
And if you go to samples folder and from there to workshop folder, you will find the PPT is linked here, but I'll, I'll just share the link of the PPT right now here in the chat. So you get it. Just keep this open so that we can copy the, I don't know if you can copy the commands easily from this window. I think it's gonna be tricky, but at least you can type them out if required. Uh, so I'm gonna do that. Oops, not the... Cool, so as you can see, I have created an environment called Fission. And if I do Fission ENV list, uh, it tells me it's a node environment, like a name node, and it uses an image called fiction slash node env. And it gives me a bunch of other you know parameters like what is the pool size, you know, what is the min memory, max memory, and bunch of those right. Cool. So come back to our slide. Cool. So we created the environment. Uh, you know, we have pool size one, and we'll talk about what pool size means later, but let's you know kind of go and understand other concepts basically. Now, once you have your environment, you ideally want to deploy some code on top of that, right? So that is where the concept of package comes in picture. A package is nothing but the user code and some dependencies, right? And this could be a couple of variations, we'll talk about that. So you could say, I have just a single code file. Like in Python or Node.js, you write just a simple script. It could just be a single file, no dependencies whatsoever. Just the pure vanilla, you know, runtime-based code, basically, right? So then you can use the code flag to say, I have a single code file. But more often than not, you will have multiple source files and you'll have dependencies, right? So you might say, I need this library A, library B, whatever of that sort. In that case, you can specify using source. Now, the idea here is if you specify source, you want that source to be compiled, dependencies to be downloaded and everything to be packaged as a package. That's where you need build, of course. So you'll, you'll expect the fission to build it out for you. So you'll have passed the flags accordingly. A lot of times you might also say, hey, you know what? I don't want to use the fission builder concept. I will build the code outside of fission and just provide my you know, deployable archives to fission basically, right? In that case, what you can do is you can still build stuff outside and you can use the deploy flag to uh, provide uh, fission, the, the deployable archive, right? So if you take an example of Java, for example, right? You can say, I already built a jar in whatever format fission needs and I'll just give you the jar. That's the deploy archive that you would use, right? So those are the three forms of, uh, you know, in which you can give package, but inherently it is basically, uh, you know, user code and dependencies, uh, you know, as a, as abstract concept level, basically, right? So now you've got base environment. We got a package which contains our code and dependencies, right? So two things we have covered so far. Now let's create a package as well, right? And would it help if I share this slide with all of you folks to copy the commands or are you comfortable typing this out, you know, whatever you see here? Or I can type and, and you know, paste the commands as well while we are you know, doing this in the chat so that that gets easier for you as well. Let me do that. Cool. So that was the command I ran earlier to create an environment. The next command I'm gonna run is to create the package, right? right. So that is the second command I just pasted. I'm gonna run it here. So, as you can notice here, one thing, I'm using the code flag. That means I'm having a single file with no dependencies whatsoever. Let me also open this URL. So you see what is the code that we are running this, right? Now, as you can see, it's a simple JS function. Uh, we follow a specific syntax, you know, where we say async function and context, you know, is the signature basically. And within that, you know, uh, thing, whatever you write is basically the function code basically. And this is what we are creating package with. So let me go ahead and do that. Now, Fission is gonna go and actually fetch that, you know, JS file and create an hello JS package, right? Now, if I do again, Fission PKG or, you know, short form for package list, you will see a package, uh, you know, being created. And as you might have noticed, the build status here is already succeeded because Node.js doesn't require like compilation and we don't have a dependency to be downloaded. So that's why it like state of succeeded. Had we had a code base and then some libraries, then would have you know gone into running state and then eventually gone into succeeded state, and, and we'll talk about that again shortly later, right? So that's the package part of it. Right? Cool. Now, what is the function, right? You got the base environment, you got the code and and dependencies, everything packed in, right? You want some more configuration on top of that, right? You might want to say, hey, the scaling behavior should be like this, the timeout should be like this these secrets should be loaded or this config map should be, you know, mounted and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. 
So all these things, uh, you know, is uh, you know what uh, function is basically, right? And and function also has a lot of execution strategies. We'll talk about execution strategies slightly later, but but that's what is function. Uh, Snehal, I just see that you joined. Uh, we kind of started like about 15 odd minutes ago. Um, why don't you briefly introduce yourself and I can catch you up on anything, you know, that you have lagging in terms of setup or whatever. Sure, sure, Vishal. So good morning. Uh, and uh, I'm Snehal Pandey. Uh, I'm working as a software engineer in Siemens and uh, I have overall six and a half years of IT experience and uh, uh, out of which uh, two and a half years is in DevOps. And uh, I have read about uh, Fission on the company website, InfraCloud company website, and I found it really interesting. So, um, and later on, I came to know about this session. So I thought of joining uh, and uh, in future, if I, uh, I am planning to contribute as well. So that is why I thought this would be the good start. Great, great. And in terms of setup, do you have Fission everything installed and stuff, uh, Snehal? No, no, I do not have anything yet. I just read the doc, uh, a bit of documentation. Okay, okay, cool. So if you plan to follow along in the workshop, uh, we can, you know, after like after we finish maybe initial one or two sections, we can come back and you know have you set up or whatever. Okay, okay. Uh, Vishal, I just have one question uh, because yeah. uh, I'm uh, I'm late. I missed uh, initial part. So uh, will we have the recording available of this session? Yes, recording will be available, uh, and and you know you can talk to organizers; they'll they'll share with you. And in the meantime, if you go to installation uh, like the page, and if you have a Kubernetes cluster running, you can just get the you know efficient setup done so that you can follow along. You know what we are doing as well. Okay, sure, sure. Thank and you. Let me know if you run into any issues or difficulties with that. Sure. Cool. I'll just paste this link Thank in the chat so you can use it. Thank you. No worries. Cool. So that's a function. Uh, it's basically a combination of, or it uses environment, it uses package, and then it has you know a bunch of other things uh, which are like runtime configs on top of that. Uh, you know, is what is called function. Basically. So let's go ahead and create a function using the package and the environment that we created earlier, right? And let me again paste that command so you can follow along and, and use the same command. Oops. Cool. So I'm using the, you know, uh, HelloJS, or I'm creating a HelloJS function using Node as environment and HelloJS as the package. Right? Let's see. It's taking so much time. Okay. Uh, connection seems okay. Yeah, the first one takes time. It will work. No, not uh, the invocation would take, but the creation shouldn't take so much time. Done it a couple of times in two, three days. Oh. oh, is it? I've done this a couple of times. The first time is always slow. Creating a first function. For me, oh, wow. it is yeah. See? That is weird. I have never seen this happen with me at least. Uh, something to investigate probably. For me, it was created uh, quickly. Okay. Okay, Ganesh. Cool. So as you can see, the function is now we can do a list of function and it, it can list a function. It is of type pool manager. I'll, I'll talk about what that means slightly later. Now let's go and test this function, right? So you can actually use the handy command within function to say fission function test and hello JS. And there we go. Hopefully hello world appears. Yeah, it does appear. Okay, great. Cool. So that's a very simple basic function we created using Node.js environment and a simple you know, uh, JavaScript. Code file basically. But uh, you know, I, I use the Fission's function uh, utility uh, to call function, but there are various ways to call functions, right? And and we talked about this slightly earlier. So one is of course over HTTP, right? It could be gRPC, WebSocket, or plain you know standard HTTP using HTTP triggers. So similar to environment and function and package objects. So HTTP trigger is an object in Fission, which allows you to expose functions outside of the cluster using you know, HTTP as a way of calling them, right? The second way you can expose those functions outside is using message queue or data change as a, as a trigger, right? And they are broadly categorized into MQ trigger, which stands for message queue trigger. And I think as I said before, message queue is probably slightly narrowing term, 
but basically what they, what they do is you know any chain any time there is a change in data or any time there is a message in the queue that trigger will call a specific function right that's what the m2 trigger does and similarly we have time trigger which basically calls a function based on some time you know format basically right uh, like every hour minute whatever you want to do it now in the previous step of course we did not uh, uh, create a trigger. So now let me go ahead and create a trigger. Uh, it's simple HTTP trigger, and I'll again paste this command here so that you can use it. Great. So I'm going to create a trigger. And now, important point is you need to get the address of the router. So in my case, the router has a load balancer IP address, right? Uh, and I can use that. If you're using kind or something similar, I believe you can use your node port along with the host, you know, whichever is explicit, right? But if I do here, for example, curl, and use this IP address, and then say, uh, what is the URL I use? Hello. Ideally, I should get a response. Okay, I do get a response, right? So that is the hello window. So uh, instead of using a, a function test utility, I basically now expose my function to outside world, so now you can use this URL. Any of you, you know, can use this URL and actually call the function, right? So that's what we did just now. Cool. So in a in a nutshell, you know, we just covered some basics of, uh, you know, basic objects of uh, basically fission uh, environment, which is basically a base runtime of a function. Package uh, is a function core and dependencies put together, and then function basically combines your environment and package with some runtime configuration to create a function. Uh, on trigger, you have you know multiple triggers, HTTP, a message to base trigger or a time based trigger, and you can you know call the functions various ways, right? There are a couple of other objects like Kubernetes watch triggers and canary configs. We did not cover them. They are not super important to the core of what we need to understand in the workshop, but I'm happy to explain them later once you have you know we have gone through the workshop and great. So that was the first section basically, right? We talked about very basic, simple concepts. Everybody following so along, any doubts, questions? Don't hesitate to stop me in between as well. You know, and I will ask questions, please. Cool. Should we go ahead? Yep. Awesome. Great. Now let's talk about scheduling and execution strategies. And I think this is where a lot of uh, you know important you know things around execution uh, we'll we'll talk about. So there are right now broadly three execution strategies in Fission. One is called a pool manager. Pool manager maintains an idle pool. Idle pool as in a pool of warm pods, which are ready to serve requests as soon as there is a request in, right? And they are made into specific functions on the fly, right? And the goal here is to optimize for resources. And there's definitely some amount of latency overhead. Now, we try to promise 100 millisecond overhead in the request path, but that really depends a lot on the language, right? Like if you're using Java versus Go versus Python, there's a little bit of uh, variation in that over there. The second execution strategy is called new deploy. Uh, what it basically does is it, it basically runs a service almost uh, all the time. And there is no latency overhead, but there's of course cost of you running that service almost forever basically, right? And this is almost like running a microservice if you have to call it that way is uh, using fission. Uh, it basically creates, and we'll talk about that in detail uh, what it creates, right? The third is a container as a function as I talked earlier, uh, where you give uh, fission a container image and it'll simply run it for you. This is still under development. Uh, it will be merged sometime this week or next week into the master branch and will be released in the next release. Uh, but you know, this is something very new feature in the fish net suite, right? And here you don't need to create environments. You can directly create a function using the image, and that's about it, right? And rest of the thing like trigger or you know other things will will still remain. Cool. Now let's go and understand the pool manager strategy a little more in detail. There's a lot going on over there. Okay. So when we created an environment. It creates a pool of pool size three by default. We created one in our case when we created, right? And what basically it does is it creates a deployment with replica equivalent of pool size, right? Now this pool acts as a warm pool and there is no package yet. So there is no function or anything of that sort, right? So what happens is it creates just the base runtime environment with as many replicas as you specified in the pool size as a deployment, right? So that is the first thing that happens. Now, when a request comes, what happens is one environment is taken outside of this deployment by re labeling. So, the way Kubernetes deployments work is you label a deployment certain way that they are part of a deployment, right? 
uh, a pod certain way so that they are part of a deployment. The moment you remove that label, it doesn't remain part of that deployment, right? So it is taken out. And since it is taken out, now the replica says doc to two, what happens is Kubernetes deployment will eventually you know, restore that from two to three again. So the, your pool still <coughs> remains at size three. And now let's see what happens with the pod we took out. Hey, uh, Carl, I see you just joined. Hi. Hey. Uh, hey. We kind of started around 10, 15. Uh, so you might have lost, lost a little bit of uh, initial thing, but uh, recording will be, of course, available later. Are you set up with Fission and everything? Uh, no, right now I don't have a setup. OK, OK. Uh, why don't you go to this documentation page on the Fission website? Uh, that will get your setup done uh, on whatever Kubernetes cluster you have. And in the meantime, you know, we can uh, let you up on some concepts and stuff uh, and, and talk about them later. Yeah? Sure, sure, sure. I, I'll do that. Thanks. Cool. And do you want to briefly introduce yourself, Carl? Like, we just had a round of protection for everybody else as well. Sorry, I didn't get that. Uh, do you want to briefly introduce yourself? You know, what do you do and what brings you to Fission Workshop? Uh, right. Uh, so I, I I currently work as a uh, software engineer with GS Lab, uh, and uh, we have started with Fission some time back. Uh, so we are just here. To, uh, so we work with Kubernetes, Docker, and all the stuff. But uh, right now we are looking into Fission and trying to see how we can use Fission as well. Got it. Got it. Fine. Cool. So I'll continue, Thanks. but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll come back and probably catch you up on some concepts uh, a little short later. Yeah. Sure, sure. Thanks. Cool. So as I was talking earlier, one environment pod is taken out uh, and the same is restored by your deployment. Now let's see what happens with this pod which was taken out of deployment, right? Now the pod which was taken out of deployment, uh, what happens is the, the code which, you know, for the function which needs to be executed, the code is retrieved from the storage service. And then that code is basically dropped onto that environment, right? So this is dynamically loaded into the memory. And then the actual code is executed by, uh, by the uh, executor, basically. And this all happens on the request path, uh, you know, specializing of the pod, meaning taking that pod out of the pool, uh, getting the code, and then executing that, right? Uh, and we'll look at the, mechanism of actually loading the code in detail later, but but just let's for the time being, you know, understand that, right? Now, if more request comes, right, more pods are specialized, meaning you take out one pod, you get the code, you loaded that into the, you know, pod, and then you, you know, uh, then you route the request, that pod basically, right? And let's say now there are four requests coming parallelly, right? Four pods are specialized. Now, let's say one of these finishes and the fifth request comes, you can reuse this pod because there is nobody right now using that pod, basically, right? And, and this number, the number of maximum specialized pods at any given point in time is same as concurrency. So concurrency is a parameter that you specify when you create a function. You can say, I want a pool size of five, but I want a concurrency of thousand, for example, right? So no more than thousand function pods should be created at any point in time, right? That's, that's the concurrency concept in Fission. You can also do this. You can say my one function pod, which is specialized, can handle more than one request, right? So request per pod, RPP is the parameter that is configured. Now, right now it's configured to three. So each function pod will be sent three requests at the same time. So technically, if you have four specialized pods, you could be serving 12 requests at the same time, right? And these things are provided based on use case. You can you know, fine tune and you know, make them like uh, work for your use case, right? Like some users want to say, uh, they say, I want to execute only one request at a time in a pod because you know there is some user sensitive data and I don't want that to be shared with anybody else or whatever of that sort, right? So, so all those things uh, drive, you know, how do you set concurrency and, you know, RPP and stuff like that, right? Now, once your all requests are gone and there is no more request coming in, patient will wait for, let's say, a, a time of, you know, duration, which is idle timeout, configurable for function. These specialized pods will be killed, right? They'll be cleaned up, basically. Your pool still remains. Pool is not affected, basically, right? And if say more requests come in later after these four were killed, again, the same process will repeat. You'll take out one pod from the pool, specialize it, let it execute the request and let, let it lie around for some time before it is killed again. Right? Now, this is the basic you know, working mechanism, right? Now, if you look at uh, a simple, you know, kind of realistic use case, typically what people do is create an environment called Python, for example, right? 
and uh, create with a pool size of three. And that Python environment can be used by multiple functions, right? So you could have function A doing A operation, function B doing some other operation, function C doing the same operation, but they all underlying use the same environment, which is Python environment that we created, right? And again, as I said earlier, you could technically have two Python environments as well, right? You can have one Python for data uh, related you know, work. You could have another Python environment for let's say machine learning related work because their libraries are different and everything of that sort. So if you go by this logic, uh, when there is no request coming in, you are maintaining only a three pod uh, deployment. But when there are requests coming in, you're scaling that out to 16 pods without doing anything, all, all pre-configured, so to speak, right? And the scale and scale out is, is what makes it so efficient in using resources. Now, in real world, of course, people do have multiple languages or multiple environments, right? So, so something like this would be a more realistic scenario where you have one environment of Python with replica three, another environment of Node.js with replica five or full size five. Because maybe we are expecting Node.js to get more requests, we, we keep a slightly bigger pool size there. On Python-based environment, there are three functions, A, B, and C. And as the requests come in, they're all specialized, executed, and cleaned up, and all that stuff, right? And for Node.js environment, we have three more functions, P, Q, and R, right? Again, based on the requests coming in, they are specialized, executed, and then cleaned up as, as you go on the fly. Uh, but even with this, for example, if there are no requests coming in, we are only maintaining these eight pods. And when there are requests coming in, we are maintaining probably what, 20, 25 odd pods scaled out dynamically, and then scaled back to, you know, the earlier number, the zero number or pool number basically, right? Cool, so that's a basic pool manager working. Now, when to use pool manager, right? So it is really good for dynamic workloads. When you expect something to suddenly burst and then suddenly burst down, you know, uh, 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 on the fly, you know, uh, and you don't know that pattern basically, right? It is also a good fit for event-driven workloads. The reason being, we are adding a little bit of latency here uh, in the request path, right? So we want to uh, make sure that you know the latency uh, can be accommodated by the workload, and then you can use one common environment by many functions. So, so that is another you know uh, use case where you can say, hey, I have this Python environment, and I want my all developers to use the same environment and write code on top of that. Right? So that's where also you could use uh, this uh, single environment and multiple functions. Cool, uh, Ashirwad, I see you joined uh, recently. Uh, uh, do you have everything set up and stuff to follow along when you do hands on? Uh, I don't think I can hear you, Ashirwad. Okay, we'll, we'll come back when Ashirwad has uh, fixed his audio or you can ping or try talking when you have fixed your audio, Ashirwad. Cool, so that was pool manager working. Any questions, doubts in that? This is a super core and critical piece for understanding you know, friction uh, in a way. So uh, Vishal is pool manager and warm pool same term, term, two terms to representing the same concept. So pool manager is the type of execution that you want to use, right? And this pool that we maintain, the warm pool, is is what is created when you create a pool manager function. Okay, okay. So the 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 backups or I would say the core containers of the pods that we have in the pool yeah. are the the warm pool. Okay, thanks. Correct, correct. So think of them like. Uh, warm pool is almost like, you know, you have started a pod because see, if a request come, starting a pod will take a lot of time, right? You So you started that pod already. You also have a server running yeah. uh, in that pod. So when the request comes, all you have to do is check the code and execute it, right? And yeah. that's why it's called warm pod so that, you know, the time to execute when the request comes is like minimal in a way. Yep, yep. Thanks. Cool. Any, any other questions? Cool. So uh, again, feel free to stop me if you have questions. I'll I'll continue. Uh, all right. So how about watching this in action? So let's do that, right? So first of all, I'm gonna do uh, get the pods in the friction function namespace, right? As you can see right now, there is only one pod, and it's a pool pod. I'll I'll tell you why it is a pool pod, right? Let me do this. So I'll do watch uh, this uh, namespace, you know, for pods now, right? Here, now I'll call the same function. I hope hello.js was the name. As soon as I enter and the request starts executing, 
you will see now there are two parts. There was D7 FVF and then there is LS FRC, right? So there are two parts. One part was taken out of pool, right? And, and as soon as we took out the pool part, the, the original part was replaced by a deployment with a new part. And the second part, the part that was taken out was used for execution. Now, if I look at labels of these, right? You will see this part has a function name called hello.js. This means this part is right now uh, a function part actually. And this part doesn't have a function name and manage equal to true. That means it's part of the pool, right? And I can again show you this, you know, with by probably creating like three warm pool and then, you know, firing a request, but fundamentally it's, it's the same mechanism, right? Uh, initially there was one part and now there are two parts, right? And uh, if I fire the request again, it won't add another part. It will simply use one of those parts to execute the same request. Or did it create a request? Okay, it did create for some reason. Uh, I believe that is either a bug or some configuration problem from my side, but now we have two HelloJS parts, right? So it did create new parts. And if you wait for another like two, three minutes, these two parts, which are created for HelloJS function, they'll be cleaned up. They'll be cleaned up by uh, Fission and, and you know, uh, we'll then have just one part uh, in the pool uh, over there basically, right? Cool, so that's the thing. Uh, let me do curl again and see if, actually create another part like that. Probably an issue or a bug. Or my RPP settings might be wrong or something of that sort. Cool, so for every request I actually created a part, uh, it could have reused that, but maybe my configuration is a bit off there. But you get the point, for every request we, Create a part and reuse that part if required, or, or you know, based on configuration and stuff. Uh, what's the default RPP? Default RPP is one, but that's about concurrency, right? Basically, yeah. Uh, meaning you are saying at a time only execute one uh, request in a part. Okay, because now you can see that one is terminating, the oldest one basically. So now you should have only parts running and then one terminating and the other two will terminate in a, in a short run basically. Uh, yeah, hi Risha. Hi Gorish. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I can relate most of I means I can, I worked on open with, so I can relate most Definitely. of the stuff here. Okay. Uh -huh. So just wanted to know, like, uh, is there like something on, uh, there is something like cold and warm start, right? In open right. with, like uh, something like that is there over here. And is there a, like, Difference in the latency for calls. Correct, correct. Excellent question, Girish. So right now, what we did with pool manager is basically cold start, meaning we had a pod ready, and okay. when the request came, we did some stuff and then executed the request. Right. So that's basically cold start. The other uh, executor that we have, which is pool uh, new deploy, is basically warm start. What it does is it already does all that operation beforehand before the request comes, and then simply routes the request when it comes actually. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So now coming to new deploy, right? Now new deploy, basically uh, what it does is the moment you create the function and environment, it creates a function pod or deployment, and then it creates HP and also creates a Kubernetes service. All this when you create immediately when you create the function. So now when the request comes, there is no loading of code or anything of that sort of happening on the fly. What is simply happening is as soon as the request comes, proxy it to the actual pod which has the function code and you know return the response. So zero latency. And to answer your question, Girish, this is what the uh, warm uh, uh, thing is, not the cold one, basically. Great. So, uh, and and the new deployment also has HPA. So, if the more request comes in, it will keep scaling those parts, you know, to you know one, two, three, four, whatever you want to set it out to be. And you can always say, this is my minimum scale, this is my maximum scale, and and you know uh, that controls the number of replicas and stuff. And here, of course, we are talking about zero latency because there is no uh, cold start happening here. Now, of course, the trade-off is you are saying I have to have always, you know, whatever number of pods I need, always running these, right? Now, when to use deployment, new deployment executor. Now, if you can't tolerate any latency, let's say you're serving a website, uh, you know, a static site or whatever, right? You don't want any latency in the user request path. That's when you could use new deployment. The workloads are fairly static and they don't change is another use case because in case of pool manager, you scale out very fast and then you scale, you know, back in as required. And this can also be a great uh, way to use it, you know, for some user facing microservices basically, right? So let's go ahead and actually create uh, a new deployment function. 
Yeah, as you can see from the previous one, only one pod is running now. Others are in thermodynamic state. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create the same command, right? But instead of now, uh, cool. So I'm creating the same. Uh, or I had to change the name, of course. <laughs> uh, hello JS. I'll call it. Let's say warm, right? And I'm using the same environment. I'm using uh, the same package, but I'm just altering the executor type, right? Now let's watch what's happening in that namespace as soon as we do this. Oh, okay. That's good. I need to provide the value. Sorry about that. Cool. Now, as you saw, it created a new function pod called new deploy hello js warm and it is probably gonna uh, you know load function everything is done already basically right so now if i now call this fn test right hello js warm no new pod is gonna get added you're gonna get a response for sure Something is wrong here. Oh, it actually returned a response, which is an HTML body. That's very interesting. Let's see what is happening here. Fetching of the code was fine. Oh, I had to probably specify the method. Let's see. The default is get, so that should have worked. See what's happening here. So this is our uh, new deploy pod. But there is some error here. Error kind of function environment pod for special request returning retrying. Specialized request done. Eventually it was done. So that's not a problem at all. Server is running as well. Let's see. Let's try testing again. Okay. Interestingly, it is running some body, uh, HTML body, but there is an error in the title. That's super strange. Cannot get FN norm. I don't know what is that. And the log doesn't tell me anything right now, at least. Okay, uh, I think I'll have to file a bug for this. And then there's something wrong with this. So, Vishal, I also observed the same issue 404. Okay. The function I created. So, yesterday I created a function uh, from the examples file. Right. So that is working for me. But okay. when I created this hello JS, uh, it gave me 404. Okay, and which uh, example file you're mentioning, Ganesh? Uh, the one I created today, uh, okay. along with you, hello JS one, giving uh -huh. me uh, 404. But the one which I created from the uh, examples file, hello only. Okay. Uh, so, so that is working for me. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Got it. Did I specify the entry point? Okay, I'll, I'll take a look at this later. Uh, there's probably there's something wrong with my function code or something. Cool. Uh, cool. So that was no deployment. No, briefly working for you. So we watched the demo, of course, and it didn't work. Uh, so that's cool. But I'll, I'll fix that and you know uh, let you know later on like fixing flag or something. Cool. Now the third uh, one, which is heavily under active development, is the container as a function. Uh, and basically, you know, you can give it a container image uh, to Fission, and it runs it for you. Uh, this is still under heavy active development. So right now, uh, you know, uh, it is it is going to uh, go heavy change, and you know, more uh, you know, features are going to get introduced. And watch out the documentation for this one uh, as as we update. Cool. So now I want to go a little bit in, you know, deeper as to how the environment really works basically, right? So we talked about that code loading and stuff like that, right? So when you create the pods, right? So if I describe you one of these pods, for example, 
the terminating is running one. Uh, I will specify the namespace. Good. So if you look at this pod, actually, there are two containers running here. One is a fetcher container, all right? And then there is the actual node container, it's, right? You, you see that, right? One is node container, the other is a fetcher container. What is happening is the moment you create an environment, the environment container starts, which is the language time runtime environment like Node or Go or you know Python, whatever maybe there. there is a simple web server running in there in the environment container. On the side, there is a fetcher container, and this fetcher is a very lightweight GoLang container, super super thin. Uh, you know, doesn't doesn't do a lot of computation and stuff. But this fetcher allows you to talk to the storage service of Fission to get the code for a function when there is a request for the function, basically, right? So what happens is when the request comes. Uh, fission first goes and you know talks to that pod and tells the fetcher, hey, there is a request for function ABC. Why don't you go and get the code for function ABC from storage service and load it into the environment container, right? And the environment container has an endpoint called specialize, which basically loads this container into the memory. So fetcher goes, grabs the code from storage service, places it on the file system at a certain path, and then environment container simply loads it. So fetcher basically calls the environment's endpoint and say, hey, I have placed the file here. Why don't you load it into the memory, basically, right? So fetcher has a very simple, you know, three or four API endpoints. One is called fetch, which basically goes and fetches the code of the function from a specific storage service for a given function. And the specialize is what is called by fission, but fetcher in turn basically simply calls environments fetcher, uh, sorry, specialize endpoint, and tells that you know please load this code. And then there are other endpoints which will not talk too much in detail. They are used by other systems, so to speak. But this is the internal working of how the loading of the code works. Again, as a user, you don't need to know absolutely in detail, but you know, I just thought I'll, I'll kind of briefly talk about it. Cool. Uh, any questions on this so far? Cool. Now we're talking about a bunch of things. Uh, just to recap, you know, for some of the folks who have joined a little later, we talked about environment. Uh, environment is your base runtime. It includes the base OS and some dependencies that you absolutely need in the environment, right? The package is a function code and dependencies put together. So you can say I have you know this code and then I need X library, Y library, you know whatever other things. The function basically combines your environment and package, and then it has some runtime configuration, some runtime strategies, uh, which is what makes the function function. Then you have triggers. We have three types of triggers: the HTTP trigger, the MQ trigger, and time trigger. HTTP trigger allows you to call functions using HTTP protocols like gRTC, WebSocket, even plain vanilla HTTP. The MQ trigger allows you to call functions when there is either a message in the message queue or there is a database change uh, you know, of data. And then there is a third, which is time trigger. Uh, so it calls the function every particular time interval, you know, or whatever of that sort, right? Cool, so those are the objects that we talked about. Let's go look at very briefly the entire architecture of Fission now. Great, so you have the environment again, right? The dependencies plus OS and time. You have the package, which has user code plus additional dependencies, right? These two put together is what makes function. Within function, we have two kinds of executors. The pool manager, which maintains a warm pool of pods, and it has some cold start, because what it does is when the request comes, it goes and grabs the code from the storage service, loads it into the memory, and then executes the request. So the time it takes to do that operation is the delay, right, that we introduced. But there are trade-offs that we talked about earlier. New deploy starts, the environment and the feature pod and fetches the code right at the beginning, right? So it doesn't do in the request part. So when the request comes, you simply reverse proxy and it responds to the request. This all operations is handled by a service called an executor service, right? So executor service is the core of you know what it does, all this crazy stuff of managing pods, cleaning up pods, you know, and loading and all that stuff, right? Executor service also talks to something called as builder manager service. So if you give fission source code and ask fission to build for you or you know fetch dependencies for you, then the builder manager service does that. And we're not gonna cover that a whole lot of detail in this workshop, but I'm just mentioning it for the sake of completeness, right? Storage service is a simple service. It takes code and stores it somewhere, right? You can store it on a persistent volume as part of the container attached storage, or you can store it in S3 directly and it will fetch from S3. For time trigger, we have timer service. For FTP trigger, we have a router service. And then for MQ trigger, we have you know MQ trigger service which supports a whole lot of uh, you know, message queue triggers that we'll talk about uh, later, of course. 
and then there is controller service uh, which is like the entry point or api you know endpoint of of this whole fission thing right so that's a brief overview of fission architecture and all the components that we talked about cool so what i'm going to do folks is going to take a one minute break uh, going to go grab some water uh, and once we come back we'll probably catch up some of the folks on their uh, you know like setup and stuff and if they are you know uh, needing any help we can we can talk about that and then we'll resume in so right now it's 11:08 Probably resume at eleven twelve. Is that okay for everybody? Three four minutes break. Yep. Cool. I can pause the recording and then we can resume it. Cool. Great. So we covered the fission internals. We talked about all the concepts, the functions, environments, package uh, triggers, uh, and then we talked about various services. You know, which do all this stuff, right? Again, uh, this is not meant to be a super exhaustive, uh, detailed overview of you know what happens inside executor service and you know, all that stuff. Uh, you can join Fission Slack or you know join Fission's GitHub repo and you know understand all that later. But let's let's march on to the next area, right? Now, typically, uh, what you want in any enterprise or real-world application, a lot of applications are actually event-driven, right? So you know something happens, you need to send an email to somebody. Something happens, you know you need to do something, right? If I were to give you a very simple example. The moment you place an order onto Amazon.com or Amazon or you know very e-commerce website for that sake, right? A couple of things are happening. You are first getting an email confirmation that hey, your order has been placed, right? Another event is being sent to the warehouse where you know which is closest to your home and which is where the supply is available. That hey, this is a new customer's order, and we need to ship this, right? There's probably another confirmation coming in from the back of the payment system that hey payment is done or failed or whatever, and if it fails, you get another email that hey your payment failed, right? So everything, if you think of it, can be modeled as an event-driven system, right? So event A happens, something you know like two things might be called. On each of those two, uh, subsequent things might be called, right? So that's a very typical way to build a lot of real-world applications for it, right? And Fission supports these through something called as MQ triggers, uh, and we'll talk about uh, that you know in a moment, right? So if I talk about a simple example here, uh, there is a producer function, let's say, and that produces the message and drops into a Kafka queue. This Kafka queue is being listened to by another function, and as soon as there is a message here, this function will be invoked. Now this function does let's say a bunch of processing, and if it succeeds, it wants to put the message into response queue so that you know it can say this is done, all looks good. But if there is an error, it wants to put that into another message queue topic after topic called error, you know, topic or something of that sort, right? So again, a very simple and hypothetical example, but also could be related to very, you know, real world uh, applications, basically, right? So in Fission, we have two kinds of triggers, if I have to call them. In the original, you know, like before release one dot ten dot zero, we had traditional like MQ triggers which were built into Fission. And and they were limited to Kafka, NATs, and Azure Storage Queue, and uh, it was called MQT kind fission, uh, or they were like no type, but that was what it's called. But that is not actually maintained anymore. So if you're you know using anything new, I would suggest use the one on the right hand side, which is MQT kind Keda basically. Right? Now these are new triggers which are built on top of Keda project, and Keda project is here if you want to go and check it out. Uh, and we use Keda as the underlying you know mechanism, but we have built a layer on top of that. And currently, we have support for NATs, uh, Kafka, RabbitMQ, AWS SQS, AWS Kinesis, GCP PubSub, and then there are many more coming, right? And these are the ones that are being actively developed. They are also more efficient because the original integrations that we had in Fission for MQ triggers, they did not have scale back to zero. Whereas the ones that are built on top of Keda, they have scale back to zero functionality. So if there are no messages arriving in any of your message queues or whatever your data source is, the thing that watches your message queues or topics or you know whatever are scaled back to zero, right? So that's a very crucial point. And the moment you scale this out, this becomes very crucial that you are scale able to scale back to zero if there are no events, right? And let's look at how that works in in a moment. Uh, why this animation is there? Okay, cool. So let's assume you have a simple Go function, which is the producer function, right? And it drops the message into a request topic, topic Kafka request topic, right? Now, when there is a request uh, message in the request topic, uh, you want something to be triggered. But this trigger, you don't want to be always running, right? If you look at it in a typical world today, we run a service, it keeps listening to a message queue, and if there is a message, it does something, right? But you don't want that. So what Keda does is, 
later as long as you have it installed and have it configured to listen to a specific topic or a message queue or data source it will scale the pod to zero right only when there is a message or a you know a signal basically right incoming signal it will scale something from zero to one and there's something here in our case is kada connector which is a separate project in its own right and can be used outside of fission as well and and we'll talk about that uh, in the contribution section but these are very generic connectors which do certain things uh, so in this case what they do is they read the message from your source system the database or message queue or whatever and then they call an http endpoint and the http endpoint in our case happens to be another fission function called consumer right uh we'll look at a sample uh, example of this the consumer function is much much simpler it simply is a function where it doesn't have any idea of who is calling it what message queue it is coming from and all the stuff right and even the response like once it is done processing that message it can simply response uh, return a 200 response and the message body and it will go to kafka topic or response topic without that function having to know you know any about anything about kafka and if there is an error you return a non 200 response as a http uh, response and you return the body and that message and everything will go to the error topic right so again uh, we'll do the demo of this in the hands on section but this is what the basic concept is now i talked about this thing and i did demo this in in a uh, video i believe a couple of weeks ago i'll i'll paste that link later in the chat uh, but yeah so this is what the basic uh, mq trigger mechanism is now if you look at the mq trigger's definition uh, as we looked at the definition of you know function or uh, package or you know environment you give it a name you tell it the function to be called if there is something in that you know uh, message queue or source database source right then you say mq type kafka and mq kind kada as i said you know you want to use kada then you provide some metadata parameters right like what is the topic to watch what is the response topic what is the error topic how many times to retry if there is an error then you say this is the kafka server to which to connect to and this is the consumer group to which to connect to and all that stuff right and there are some more metadata parameters like cool down period cooling interval and all that stuff right so that's the basic definition we'll again look at this in detail when we actually go and try hands on but i just wanted to bring it up so that you know uh, we relate to what we you know talked about in earlier slides cool so we'll talk about the demo slightly later and we'll come our cover one section before that right now in terms of time i believe we are running ahead of time let's see uh 30 15 and 15 so about an hour okay we are actually not running behind we are pretty good on time so to speak cool yeah. now so far we have been using command line to create uh, you know the fission objects the function the environment the triggers whatever right now this is not ideal if you want to store this in some git kind of you know source control system right and that's where fission specs uh, come to the rescue they are basically yaml like definitions of the fission objects and then you can do all sort of ci cd stuff you can also create function everything definition on your own machine and then check it into a source code and then apply the same definition to dev or qa or in other environments basically right so let's go and try it out let's go and create a simple package and and you know a simple function and then try applying all that stuff right cool so i would uh pasting this would be a little uh hold on cool so this is what i'm going to do right let me first delete everything that i had from previous so we just start you know from the clean slate Cool. So that's what? Okay. Name. I leave the packages and stuff. It, it doesn't matter too much. Cool. So what I'm going to do is uh, I have checked in similar code in the in the example uh, repo. So by the way, uh, I think one thing you should do parallelly is check out the examples repo. Question slash examples. We'll be using these. a uh, bunch of examples and samples and other directories uh, during the hands on section which is coming up next so do copy this uh, repo if you haven't so that you can follow along the hands on part of it i'll just ping that in the chat room there you go cool
All right. So first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say efficient spec init, right? The moment you do this, it's going to create a spec directory, right? And it is going to contain all the spec that we have. So now we have specs directory, right? Next, I'm actually going to go and create uh, the fission environment. So this is the first command I'm going to follow, right? Now, if you notice one thing which is very different about this one as compared to other commands that we ran before is the spec. That means that you're not going to actually create it through the fission server, but actually you're going to create a declaration locally. And it says that, right? I saved the environment definition to this file, environment node.yaml. Similarly, I'm going to create a package. Paste the URL of that code here. We keep that open. Let me pull it up from the previous slide. So this was missing here. Fix the font later. Right? And then again, I think important part is spec. Don't create an actual system, just create the spec. Right? There we go. Great. Now let's create the function. We are probably going to run into one thing is that we already have a package named HelloJS, so let me delete that. Great. So my specs are created. I'm going to fission spec validate. So it tells me there is one function, one environment, one package, no triggers, nothing else, right? And I'm going to apply. I still haven't created anything in the server, right? So if you go to uh, actual parts, there's nothing running. Right now, up to their intermediate state. So that's that's all there. So we leave that open here, and then I'm going to spec apply. And it is going to create one function, one environment, one package uh, validation again done, and then you know it is going to create stuff. Cool. So as you can see, it has you know done stuff, and it is running now. And now I can do the same thing, which is fission function test, which we did earlier. Nothing fancy there. Sounds good. Yeah, hello world. Cool. Again, nothing fancy there, right? Nothing, nothing super complicated that I did there. But now let's go and look at the function spec code here, right? Because that will be more interesting. So if I go to sample uh, workshop and go to spec directory, so first of all, the environment definition, right? It's a simple same, you know, Kubernetes kind of format, YAML format. You have a kind, you have API version, method, and then the spec, right? In the spec, we specify pool size, runtime, version, bunch of those things, right? Similarly, package, it specifies the name, the URL from which to get the code, and everything of that sort, right? And then this function, which is, uh, you know, referencing the environment, referencing the package, has a bunch of other parameters like concurrency and, you know, whatnot and stuff, right? One file, which is here, which is not a CRD or which is not a CR from Kubernetes point of view, is this deployment config file. What it does, all it does is it keeps a track of these kind of things together and assigns it a UUID and you know actually like uh, tracks you know whole things together. Now one interesting thing we can do is actually fiction function spec right apply right and minus minus watch. Uh, hold on. Uh, Oops, not fission FN, fission spec. Right, so apply done with watch mode, right? When package updated, watching for file changes, right? Now what you can actually do is, let's go and, okay, one interesting thing is, I think we referred to the URL uh, code, so, Let's change that actually. Let's change it to a local file. Because now what I can do is I can actually change the code on my local system. And then the moment I change the code, it is going to watch that something has changed. It is going to re-upload that code into your container and then you can test it with the new code, right? So let's actually create uh, this whole thing again, the new thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to 
get this code here on my local thing. And so I'll go, I hope that works. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna store this as hello.js here. All right, definition stored here, right? Cool. And now I'm gonna recreate package. So I'll delete the previous created package here. All right. Let me just copy that command from there and then change the reference to hello.js file here. Cool. And then spec, of course, right? So great. So again, spec created, and you can go and watch the spec file here for function. Now it refers to archive, and then archive says include hello.js file on your local file system, right? Great. Now let's do spec apply with minus watch. And here, I'm going to clear this out. I hope you can see it clearly, right? The font and all is good, or you want me to make it slightly bigger? It's fine. Cool. So I did hello just test. It's going to return me hello world, but now I'm going to change this file, right? So I'm going to go and change to hello uh, vision work of folks. And I'm going to save it. The moment I save it, you are, this thing has watched the, there is there is a file change it has noticed. It has reappeared the change. Now, if I call it again, hopefully I get a response in a minute, the new one. All right, there you go, right? So this is like the development uh, you know, workflow where you can keep changing code, keep watching it, and then you know see it reflect in, in real time and actually test out the function with the new one, basically, right? So that's another beauty with spec that you can actually do. Apart from checking in the source code and the fission specs into the GitHub, you can also do like a developer workflow kind of thing with fission spec. Cool. Any questions so far? Any doubts? Do you guys have you guys been following along or do you want to like do this later? The the kind of hands-on thing? How do you want to do it? I have a couple of questions. Yes, please. Um, so how does this work in a CI environment, say like uh, say Jenkins? So I would write my code. I have a hello.js. Yep. What do I do after that? Cool. So what I can do is I can actually check in my hello.js okay. along with my spec file, right? Into the Git system. Okay. Yeah. And then now you are going to require dev. All you have to do is check out this directory and do fiction spec apply. Okay. So Jenkins will do that. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to set up fission CLI there also. Correct. Correct. Okay. Now, there is one feature request from a user that we have that, hey, I don't want to use Fission CLI to do spec apply, right? Yep. Can you enable Helm kind of scenario where you can say the package and you know, environment technically are you know custom resources of Kubernetes, so you can actually use them with Helm as well. Uh, but that is right now not possible like as of today because of this one file. So we are trying to change that. And probably in a month or two, we should have a feature where you can package all this thing as a Helm uh, you know, uh, chart and simply deploy mm -hmm. the Helm chart. Yeah, that would be beneficial. I also use um, Pulumi to bring up my infrastructure. So I also, I use the same thing. So mm -hmm. I would be able to use the Helm chart in that. But this I cannot okay. use directly. Right, right, that's right. right. Yeah. Okay. So Helm chart is coming and there is another user, another user who is working on a uh, Terraform provider. So Terraform mm -hmm. resources will also come, but uh, probably, you know, uh, one or two releases down the lane. Basically. But that's a great question, uh, Nikhil. And another question, uh, you know, which is kind of related to what you asked. Now you might say, hey, this is great for my local thing, but my dev configuration versus QA versus pod configuration is gonna be different, right? How do I maintain that, for example, right? Yep. So right now our spec are uh, in a way like, you know, uh, I would say they don't have native support. You can use something like customize to overwrite some fields. But again, that is another feature, you know, that will that'll probably be you know introduced in a, in a couple of releases where you can say, environment node definition, and then you can have configuration specific to QA or stage in a, in a different file or something of that sort, basically. Okay. Cool. So yeah, that was specs and, and the developer workflow around specs, right? Now, 
another thing i want to introduce now is when you have spec what would be nice is you can also do a lot of things like toleration stain sidecars init containers and that's where the pod spec feature comes in picture now pod spec uh, is something you can introduce in the spec so if you go to environment node here in the spec you can add a new field here in runtime called pod spec right and any field which is part of the pod spec uh, declaration right uh the pod spec actual pod spec could be introduced here so you could add you know init containers you could add image pull secrets you could add volumes and bunch of stuff so that all is possible at environment level today uh, again a lot of our users have been asking can we introduce this at function level because really what we want is at function level that difference of you know which volume to attach and all that stuff one underlying challenge there is uh, if you change anything disruptive at pod level in kubernetes you have to restart the pod and that doesn't gel well right now but that is something you know another feature that will be introduced at some point in future so and pod spec i just mentioned here i i just did a brief uh, overview but we'll cover a little more in hands on demo when we actually you know come to that section cool all right so we are at the hands on section uh, i i suggest you folks do follow along that will have the most or maximum benefit of you know the workshop but definitely Uh, you want to do it later that's cool as well and you can always you know drop on to the fish and slag and ask questions like if you get stuck anything i'm going to follow along all the four demos you know with you uh, and uh, at least apply them and you know show you running them uh, together cool great so the first demo is building a custom environment right now we talked about environments earlier right and let's say the nodejs environment that fission provides is not good enough for you what you want is a no a headless chrome installed in in nodejs environment because you want to do some scraping you know of a web page or whatever so you want to build a custom environment for within your uh, you know enterprise or for within your company's use basically right so uh, the example is in the examples repository in samples nodejs chrome hello headless uh, so let me go there oops okay here yeah. right here the environment is defined like this right so if you actually go to fission's environment uh repo let's go there and quickly watch it we have an environment called nodejs right and all you need to create this environment is two simple files one is a docker file okay and the other is a server.js file the server.js file most likely you won't change a whole lot uh, it's a very simple file as such like not more than a few hundred lines and then there is docker file right but for our requirements if you look at this docker file there is no headless chrome install right so i want chrome headless chrome to be installed right so what i'm going to do is i'm going to take this server.js from the environment file uh, and in my docker file i am adding a few things right i'm adding chromium i'm adding you know free type nss bunch of other dependencies that i need i'm also adding uh some variables called puppet here you know executable path or whatever for top that stuff right so so using these two files i'm going to create a custom environment right and to save time i have already created one for my use but basically what i can do is docker build docker push all the standard stuff so i'll i'll skip that and let's just uh yeah copy sort of js that's cool and so now this is a custom environment and i have pushed it to my own docker repo and i'm going to use that push image basically right so if you go and look at the image i'm using vishal biani node pro hyphen 1 right and now let's look at the second part of the demo which is using this custom environment to actually run headless chrome within a pod and then you know give us some results basically right so if you look at that part in the hello.js i have a simple code so we of course follow the declaration of the method which is async function right and and module dot exports within this is what we write the actual function code right so first of all we are using we are using url dot parse method to get the uh, url from the context right so context dot request dot url so i have to pass the url as part of my request when i call this function uh, i am getting the query part of it from the url parts and then i'm creating a browser and then i'm saying puppet dot launch and using chromium path uh, or chromium binary and then actually doing browser.page and using google.com as as the page to be browsed and then simply responding the content of that page to the to the you know caller of the function basically right and since i'm using this puppeteer library 
I also have package.json, which says load puppeteer and, and the puppeteer library, right? So I'm going to apply this spec and actually show you, first of all, it build from source code, these two files, and you know add the dependency on all stuff, and then actually call this function. So again, all these details are there on the readme page of this uh, directory. So you are free to try it again later, but let's test it out now. So I'm gonna go to that directory. I'm gonna do fission spec apply. Let me go to the previous one and actually delete the one that I created before. Just keeping my cluster clean so that we don't have any uh, overlapping things. I, I a lot of times give the same name to everything and then that causes like conflicts. So fission spec apply. Now this package is gonna need building. So if you go and watch the fission package list, you're actually gonna see it is running status, right? Because it's not a single file, it needs to do some stuff. And it creates a pod, it does, you know, downloads dependencies, packages everything up, and eventually it'll run to like turn to succeeded status once it is done. But it, it needs building within the cluster. Hopefully it takes another minute. Okay, it has succeeded now, right? So good to call the function now. So I'm gonna call the Chrome function. All right. As you can see, the response is the whole HTML page of google.com, right? Uh, which is what the expected output was. Wow, that's a pretty big HTML for a simple Google search page. Uh, let's go at the top. So much of JavaScript and stuff, right? So what I did is I built a custom environment using headless Chrome on top of the Node.js environment that Fission had. Then I hard coded the URL to call google.com within the function. And I call that function. Basically it went, ran headless Chrome and, and used a puppeteer library within Node.js to go and query google.com and give me the response of that, right? And there is actually a real use case for that, right? A lot of people do web scraping of various websites. They want to use functions for these kinds of libraries. So it's a HTML page. Uh, let's see if this, if we save this HTML page, maybe we'll see a Google, you know, homepage somewhere, let's see. So let me save that here, google.html. Uh, then there you go. So that was a script page using Puppeteer and you know uh, headless Chrome. Oh, it used some other language. Ah, I'm running my server in. Uh, I'm I'm running my server using the Sivo Cloud, the Google. Uh, sorry, the Sivo Cloud's K3s or you know Kubernetes servers. Maybe it used Italy as the country. To still the node or whatever, and that's why it has given me an Italian Google page. But that's, that's what it is. Great. So that was a simple uh, custom environment building, and then actually building the source code within the fiction cluster, and, and then using that package to use a function. Right. Any questions? Any doubts? Please feel free to ask. I'm assuming that's as a no question so far. Do you folks want to follow along this one or are you okay just uh, you know listening in now and then kind of do the hands-on later? I tried to do it and okay. I'm getting a 500 error. Okay. Error calling function from Chrome. Is your package uh, built already? <clears throat> I just did a spec apply in that folder. Okay. So it should have worked because it, your image is already present in the cloud, right? 
uh, yeah, image is there, but uh, mm -hmm. even if, uh, on top of image, you have to actually download that Puppeteer library, right? So can you do a fission package list, please? I do have that Chrome running. Oh, it's build status is running. Yeah, yeah. so you have to wait for it to be succeeded. Oh. So that is one feature again, you know, like uh, the function should wait till the build is succeeded and not to give you like a finite. It should say something like, hey, the package is not ready, but that's that's another feature coming soon. Right, wait for it to succeed then. Yep, yep. <clears throat> Ganesh, Kal, Ashirwad, Goro, Snehal, you folks want to try? You have any issues? Uh, Vishal, I would like to try it later. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. I'm just following up a few instructions with you. Sure. Sure. I no, no, if I'm stuck on Slack. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Thanks. Okay, I'll try later. Uh, Sounds good. Sounds good. GG? Uh, I'm running it now. I'm just waiting sure. for it. I'll update. I'll let you know. Sure. Sure. Sounds good. <clears throat> uh, I'll also try it later, Vishal. Yeah, yeah, no issues. No issues, Neil. Yeah. Cool. We'll give it a minute for Nikhil and Garo to report back and then we can move beyond that. My build failed. Oh, it did? Wow. Yes, uh, can you do me a favor? Uh, go and look at, uh, there's a pod in uh, Fission Builder namespace. I got a response and... Uh, okay. Yeah, I got a share, response. You want to share a screen, Nikhil, if you're okay? Yeah, sure. I yeah, would love to debug. Like it works for me and Gaurav, and what went wrong for you is something I would love to understand. No, I, at the end I, I see an error. I'm just seeing, looking into what the response is. Just reading it. Give me a second. Yeah, see this, this thing. Oh, no. Okay. Uh, can you do a kubectl get pod in official uh, builder namespace? Okay. And can you get the logs of that one? that node chrome part yeah it, it's working for me so the reason why it failed for me at, at first was uh, the package was still in running and as soon as it succeeded uh, i got a response yeah but in case of uh, nikhil the package building itself failed you know yeah so okay. uh, uh it'll get logs or logs again sorry sorry logs not just just logs yeah, that's what I always get confused. Yeah. Uh, and fission, uh, sorry, namespace. Hold on. Actually, the problem with me is I use this uh, uh, Ahmad's library. So I, I know all the short forms like KGPO, KLO, but I don't use the long forms anymore. Chrome uh, downloaded, one package is looking for funding. Super interesting. And can you try to get the logs of, uh, there is a builder manager service in the Fission namespace, uh, Nikhil. Uh, sorry, you have to get a pod. Or I mean, yeah, sure, you can get logs using service as well. The, yeah, that's the one, first one. Okay. Yep, let's tell the logs of that. Oh uh, yeah, fission.
Ooh. Oh, so your storage service has issues, uh, or okay, is your storage pod running fine? Not hundred percent sure about that. Uh, can you do just quickly uh, get pods in fission and space? Yeah, so you see the storage service is running, pending, right? Yes. The last but one. So what happens is the builder manager takes your source code, builds the package, and then it uploads to storage service. And then the storage yeah. service you know, will be used by the function to retrieve it. Mm -hmm. Since you don't have a volume on your uh, setup, uh, it is not provisioned, right? That's why zero mm -hmm. of one, you know, it's pending state. What you can do is there's a flag in the Helm values uh, called persistent enable is equal to false. So it'll use mm -hmm. a local host path to run the storage service. And that way, you know, your package will actually get built. Okay. Uh, so I will. To... Yeah. You want to do it later? I can help you right now as well. I mean, up to you. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. So uh, just give me one second. I'll, I'll pull up the flag and then we can <laughs> fix it. So you can do Helm upgrade fission. You're installing using Helm only, right? Yes. Just one second. So uh, just one second, um, I think here in the chat window, minus minus set, persistence dot enabled is equal to false. Um, yeah, and yeah, uh, use this flag and then also give the URL of the fission that you used, which is the entire. Yeah, and this value set. Yeah. Um, hold on. It does not need the chart. Uh, you don't need to give, uh, you need to give minus minus name, I guess, for fission. Okay. Uh, from Helm 3, that is what changed, right? If I remember it right. Um, hold on. Um, just give me a second. I'll try to figure it out. Yeah, yeah. Is Helm uh, just upgrade, right? Or half and half an upgrade? Um. It's upgrade, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Helm upgrade, and you have to first give the name, and then you give minus namespace fission, and then flags. Um, I don't want to block it, I'll try to update it. You can continue. Sure, sure. Uh, am I audible now? Yeah, we shall. Okay, great. Okay, cool. So we'll move to the next demo, but again, you know, at the end of it, if it doesn't work, Nikhil, I'll come back to and fix it for you. Cool. So third demo is to use specs to schedule functions. Uh, and what we are doing here is we are tinting one node, and then we're adding the toleration uh, in, the, in the pod spec of the function or environment in this case, so that, uh, that that function is able to schedule on that node. Now this demo works great if you have kind cluster because there's only one node. And if that node is tented, no other pod can get scheduled unless it has a toleration, right? But in case of my case, we have three nodes. So it is very possible that the uh, 
uh, the the function gets scheduled on any other node, so to speak, right? So what we will do then is we'll we'll change that demo slightly and let's see how we can tweak that. So this is in the sample spot spec example directory. We'll follow along again. So I go to pod spec example, uh, spec, and this is the need a builder service, so you can actually use it without any problems. If you go to environment definition, you will see pod spec here within the runtime, right? And within pod spec, your tolerations. But it's saying the key reservation equals fission is only the nodes you know it can tolerate, right? And if I go to uh, readme of the that directory, we are tainting a node, right? So we can taint a node. Uh, so let's actually do this. You cut will get nodes, okay? And I'm gonna tend all three nodes. So if you have three nodes, please do tend all three nodes. With reservation is equal to fission, no schedule, right? I'm gonna similarly tend other nodes as well. So what that means is on any of my three nodes, a, a pod can't get scheduled unless it has a toleration for that taint, right? Cool. And uh, let me also destroy this current one. Let's see what happens to the might go in ending state. No, they are running actually. So I'm gonna destroy the previous created one. And then we're gonna change my directory to this sample that we are working now against. Uh, for example, right? Cool. Now, before I apply, I'm temporarily gonna comment these pod spec lines. So that means now it doesn't have toleration with it, right? That means this will not get scheduled. We'll, we'll see if it does. As you can see, it created a pod, but it is in pending state. Do you know why it is in pending state? Let's describe that. It says three nodes had tents, uh, reservation fiction, and that this pod couldn't tolerate, right? So that means it couldn't get scheduled. Now let me uncomment this and then apply again. This time though, it will gonna get into running state. In a minute. Let's watch it. Oops, what happened? Uh, required value. Environment not fiction. I don't know. JS is invalid. Spec on time for spec containers. Okay, this is new for me as well. I believe some of the validations that we added recently. Uh, Cause this bug is my hunch. If I adding containers, let's see. Uh, if I can do this, let's see. Validate. Mm, has to be a uh, array. Okay, that worked. Great. Now I can apply again. Hopefully that works, let's see. Okay, now as you can see, the pod which was pending earlier was destroyed, of course, a new one was created and it got scheduled without any issue, right? And I can actually test it out as well. Uh, fiction, FN, test, nothing fancy of the output, of course, the same old output we'll get. Uh, what is the function name? Mm. Hello, JS, as usual. Great. So I just showed you the use of taints and toleration to show that you can use tolerations within functions as well uh, for tinted nodes and then accordingly schedule. Now, the, what is the use case for this, right? I'll give an example. Uh, if I have a cluster where I have, let's say, uh, some machine learning workload and it needs a GPU, right? So some functions should only get scheduled on the nodes where there is GPU. And uh, otherwise it won't work basically, right? So what I'll do is I'll taint all the nodes with GPU with some taint 
and only the functions which are running machine learning work workloads is the only one to which i'll add toleration so that they go on that node other functions can go on to other nodes right so that's a typical standard use case now i'll remove the node paint otherwise we'll running into error into other uh, you know uh, next example so let me see uh, i believe the syntax is this but let's uh, yeah that worked great so i need to taint two more nodes 1481 e a53 and 5d97 cool so now i have untended all three nodes so they are back to normal basically Cool. So, but that is just a simple example of paints and tolerations. Cool. Great. Any anybody else uh, has any questions, thought, whatever, or you know? Uh, how did you solve that? Uh, I missed that part. How did you solve that error for Node.js? Oh, okay. So what has happened is uh, we have added uh, Open API schema validation uh, in the last release. Yeah. And containers being a list needs to be declared at least even if it is empty. Okay. Okay. This line is what I added, the 21 line. I'll make a PR for this as well. And we have to probably raise a either documentation PR or a bug for this. But yeah, okay. that, is, that is the one. Cool. Uh what where did my videos go? Hold on. I'm trying it out on kind and let you know if it works. Sure, sure. I have a three node cluster on kind. So okay. Cool. So that was strange and tolerance. Now the next example, uh, which is the RabbitMQ KEDA based integration. Now for this example to work, you have to install KEDA. Okay. So in my case, I do have KEDA installed. It is in KEDA namespace, right? It is running our stuff. And you also need to make sure if you're doing a release before 1.12.0, your Helm values uh, have MQT enabled is equal to true. MQT KEDA enabled equal to, so let me just show you what I mean. Uh, so like this, Prometheus enabled false, you should have uh, MQT KEDA enabled true if you're using 1.12.0 or previous release. If you're using 1.13.1, you're fine. In that by default it is enabled. And so this KEDA integration, we hadn't enabled by default in the previous releases, but in the latest release, we Turn it on by default, basically. And again, I'll, I'll show you the value which uh, matters so that you know you're on the same page. Uh, charts, session, uh, so MQT aid KEDA should be enabled to true. Again, 1.30.1 by default that is the case. But if you're using anything 1.12.0 or previously, this has to be true. It is by default false in those releases. Make sense? Now, let's go and pick up that example. So, Kafka, Keda, Rabbit, MQ, right? Now, before I go there, if you are using kind or any local cluster, just do the Rabbit, MQ parts. And I can tell you what the changes are because it will get pretty heavy. But if you're using cloud-based cluster, you can do Kafka and RabbitMQ both parts. But of course, that means you'll have to install Kafka, you'll have to install RabbitMQ, and then come to this piece, basically, right? So I'm going to only do the RabbitMQ part so that you also see what changes I make. And uh, it will also probably take you know slightly less effort for us to get like you know, everything installed. So if I go to readme, again, all the documentation is done there as to how to install you know Keda, Kafka, and RabbitMQ and stuff. So I'm going to first install RabbitMQ. So for installing RabbitMQ, I'm going to use the crew plugin of kubectl to install. Uh, that plugin probably already is installed in my case. But I'm going to create a namespace called RabbitMQ and then create operator for RabbitMQ in that namespace. And finally, going to create a RabbitMQ uh, instance. Oops, did it finish? Yeah, cool. What is it saying? It's doing something. Come on, 
message install cluster acha uh, probably i have to wait okay it actually created great okay so my rabbit mk server is pending let's see why it is pending maybe it is looking for a disk Yeah, is waiting for this. Hopefully, it gets a risk soon. We'll wait for it a couple of more minutes while it happens, right? Cool. So I have installed RabbitMQ. You can do the same. Again, the directory is kda kafka rabbitmq within the samples directory, and readme has all the instructions. You can do the entire demo of Kafka and kda later, and I did a video on that uh, last two last week on 16th or 17th of Jan as part of the CNCF webinar. You can go and check out the CNCF webinar, which does exactly this thing. Gaurav was also there with me. Uh, yeah, auto-scaling event-driven applications with Fission and Kera. So this you can watch, which does exactly the same thing. Uh, I can paste the link to the YouTube directly here in the chat. So that's the video. Watch it later, please. Uh, let's see, RabbitMQ is up or not. Okay, it is running. Great. So we have one problem solved so far. <laughs> cool. Let's go to the sample again. Now, if you look at this entire thing right now, uh, actually, let me open that video up. Might be actually good to show the diagram which I was talking about. Okay, this is what is being demoed. One function produces messages, puts into a Kafka topic. There's another function listening to it and it listens on the request topic, gets a message. If it's able to, not able to process, it puts into error topic. If it is able to process fine, it is gonna put into response topic. On the response topic, there's another function listening in. As soon as there is a message, it kicks in the Kada thing and, and calls this function too. That drops the message into RabbitMQ, and that again another function is listening onto it, it. It gets invoked, right? We are only going to do this last part of it. We are going to simulate the function by, uh, you know, creating a body or sending body to that, you know, whatever um, function producer function of RabbitMQ. We'll watch it RabbitMQ getting a message, and we'll watch another function getting invoked as soon as there is a message in RabbitMQ. We'll also look at the auto scaling part here, right? The auto scaling part of Kada. I can do the whole thing. Like yeah, Kafka setup will take a while. So I'm just gonna skip that in the interest of time. We're already at 12 o'clock. And Kafka setup takes like good 15, 20 minutes. So I'm gonna skip that part. Cool. So gonna go here. <clears throat> uh, if you go and look at RabbitMQ producer, which is the first function. Sorry, somebody was saying something? Uh, so, uh, sorry to interrupt, Vishal. I had a query about this queue install rabbit. Mm -hmm. so I tried to do it. I think it's not working for me. Uh, so, do uh, I need anything extra? Do you, do you, do you have crew installed uh, with you, Ganesh? No, I think I don't have it. Okay, that's a good point. That's a good I'll point. do it. I'll do it. Yeah. Uh, I'll also make a note here that we need to install crew before you do this. Yeah. Thanks, Vishal. Yeah, no worries. Cool. Good point. I didn't realize. This is how documentation works, right? You, you miss a few things and then you realize when you do, somebody else tries it. Cool. So RabbitMQ producer, right? It's a simple Golang function. Again, it follows a certain syntax because, you know, it has to, uh, like follow the fission kind of method declaration of function handler gets a request in the in the request uh, in the function and it has to return a response basically right it gets a bunch of environment variables using uh, using your um, uh, you know environment variables from the from the function spec we'll look at we'll have to change those as well because i think the, the username and password will change for sure if not post and port it dials 
the AMQP port of that RabbitMQ uh, queue. And then it creates a channel and stuff, which is like a very specific to um, RabbitMQ kind of code. It declares a queue called publisher. And then eventually it writes the body to uh, this publisher thing, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tweak this function slightly. I'm gonna, instead of doing the request.body, uh, which will mean I'll have to post uh, something to the request, I will simply append a string to the publisher, okay? So I'm gonna change this to say, hey, rabbit MQ, right? Hello, rabbit MQ. Just a simple string message, nothing fancy there. And that is gonna get, uh, oops, I'm sorry. I did a mistake here. This shouldn't be here. This is fine reading the body, but instead of putting that body into the string of AMQP, I'm gonna put a string here. Okay, that is one change I did. Only one change, line number 58. And that means this is not used anymore, so I'll underscore it. In fact, I can get rid of this whole body, doesn't matter. Uh, yep, that's about it. Yep, cool. So our change is line number 56, change from request body to a static string and then remove the corresponding line at around 41, 42. So this producer function is good now, right? So producer function is writing to RabbitMQ. And there's dependency, of course, you'll need to use the AMQ, MQ, AMQP library and stuff. So all that is stuff there. Now let's go and configure the RabbitMQ producer functions environment variables, right? So function producer, or actually I will do this in environment Golang because that's where all the variables are there, right? So my RabbitMQ address is same because I have installed in the RabbitMQ namespace and name is same, all that stuff. So if we go and verify that, AG SVC in RabbitMQ namespace. There is a RabbitMQ service. So we are good there. RabbitMQ service exists in RabbitMQ namespace, you know, and at port 5672. But we need to find out the username and password of our RabbitMQ server. And I believe the key, the true plugin will help us there. Just one second. Uh, all right. This is the command to get the secret of the RabbitMQ. Good, so I'm gonna copy these values from here and paste into the uh, environment variables, the RabbitMQ username and password. Please don't hack my RabbitMQ. Now that you know passwords. Uh, cool, so that's it. But I also wanna open the dashboard of RabbitMQ so we can actually watch it. Uh, Let's see under command for that from the Crew plugin of RabbitMQ. I really like this plugin of RabbitMQ of Crew. Makes using RabbitMQ so much more easier. Cool, so it has done a port forwarding and proxy and everything and you know, all that is set up for me, so good. So I'll minimize this window. If I go to examples, samples, and last demo we did was spec. Like destroy from the previous one. Cool. And now we're going to switch to the other directory, which has Kada Kafka demo. Yep. Now, if you go to RabbitMQ, you will need to enter the username and password. So, I'm going to use the same username and password that I grabbed a little while earlier. So, we see the UI of the RabbitMQ. Cool. And yeah, you can see uh, there is a bunch of stuff here. If you go to queues, there is no queue right now, I believe. It will be created once we have a producer function and it will it'll see the inflow of messages and stuff. So that's RabbitMQ dashboard. So we can watch when we actually invoke the function. Great. I believe we don't need to change anything else. The consumer function is all set. Now, before we go there, one interesting thing I'll show you. Okay, we haven't actually applied anything, so of course we won't see anything right now. Cool. So I'm gonna do fission spec applied. Now, of course, it's gonna create the function for Kafka and all that stuff. They'll fail. I don't care about that. I just care about my RabbitMQ function, the producer one, the consumer one, and we'll look at that, right? So we're gonna do fission spec apply. 
It has four functions, two environments, four packages, and three message two triggers, right? As we saw in that diagram, basically. We are only interested in two functions and one trigger. We'll look at that. Now, as soon as you did this, you remember I did this kubectl get deploy in minus default namespace. There was nothing, but if I run it now, you will see one or three deployments, right? K2K is for Kafka to Kafka triggers. R2F is for RabbitMQ to function, and then K2R is for Kafka to RabbitMQ, you know, thing, right? One thing, if you see interesting, the available replicas is right now zero for almost all of them. There is one for one of them. Uh, it'll, it'll come back to zero. Let's just wait for a minute, right? Yeah, it's coming back to zero. Similarly, if you go and do HPA, uh, there's no HPA. That's weird. That should be an HPA. So what happened is when we created the trigger, three of the triggers, right? Uh, three triggers we created. For each of the triggers, we asked Keda, or we actually created three scalars of Keda. So scalars is this concept in Keda, which basically scales things back to zero if there is nothing happening, right? And as you can see, it has created the scalars or corresponding deployments, and it has scaled it back to zero. And of course, if you do typically get pods, you'll not see anything. So there is no pods running. Or why, why is not finding it images for something? Wrong here. Here you. Username or password not allowed. That's a weird thing. I remember I had worked on this with 1.12.0 without any issues. I to see if anything has changed in 1.13.1. But let us see. Let's. Computed error. And the interesting point is the one that we need, R2F, which is rabbit to function, is the one that is having error. So not, not very good. I can always try to uh, downgrade to 1.12.0 and see if it is still, let me see, adblock may not go, this is 158. So let me go to Keda connector and see what's wrong there. Aha, uh -huh. this is what is happening probably. Actually, what is the error? Fail to establish connection to RabbitMQ. And why is that? Is our service URL wrong? Or is our username password wrong? I think we just logged in with the username password, so that's fine. Maybe our URL is wrong. Let's see, let's verify that. Uh, I think everything is okay. All three are having the same issues. Let me look at this. What's wrong with this guy? Kafka is expected because Kafka, we are not running Kafka. So it's not going to reach Kafka. So that's, that's it. So let's ignore that one, basically. This should have worked. Let me do one thing. Let me do. Uh, let me remove the power ones. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to help, but it, it just does. So maybe when we created the pod, RabbitMQ is already running, so it should have been able to reach. Oh, it's running now. There you go. So RabbitMQ is probably just booting up, and that's why uh, you see it. Oh, it added out again. Weird. Username or password not allowed. That's a weird one. Why username and password is not allowed? And this is seemed to be coming from when connecting to RabbitMQ. So 
Okay, we'll take another five minutes to debug this. If it doesn't solve, then we'll kind of skip for the demo for the time being. But same thing did work here. So I'll show you the video in the worst case. Uh, but ideally, I would like to show you the real thing. So what happens is, uh, let's see. Regarding the host and the connection is coming from uh, <clears throat> from metadata. It's giving it the username and password. Everything looks good here. I can try to uh, change my version of private to connector. Let me see which one I was. I was actually using the same connector, so that should be fine. Ah, actually, I can do this. Uh, let me change the version of RabbitMQ connector. I, I remember earlier connector was actually good, so let me let me try that quickly. So I'm gonna do this. I believe I'm using one of thirteen one ones. That shouldn't be a problem. But what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna. change the image of RabbitMQ to use 0.5, which was an earlier image. I remember that did work. So MQTK dot enter images dot RabbitMQ dot version or tag is all I need to update. Two point uh, private MQ HTTP connector. This was updated about a month ago. Does it have a previous tag? It has 0.5. So I'll use 0.5, B.5. And of course, I have to use. Let's see if that works. Uh, that's weird. You have to use dash dash set in again for the Prometheus. Oh yeah, you're right. That's a good point. But even after removing all that, it did fail with some other issue. And upgrade requires two arguments, okay. Uh, what are the two arguments? Namespace fission, fission. Yeah, the two arguments, no. Oh, I'll tell the chart, I guess. Yeah. So, what was the chart thing that we recently changed to? This one. Yeah. Mm. That should most likely work. Let's see. Let's see. In between, I'm going to destroy this once more. Uh, the reason is, I'll tell you why. Oops, I'm upgrading while also destroying here. <laughs> Something else too. Upgrade is having some issues. Back off limit exceeded. Still failed. Okay, I'm gonna do one more hacky thing now. If this one works, uh, the last attempt. If not, you will see. There is MQ trigger KDA service, and I, if I do a KG deploy of that, and if I look at that, if I do KG edit deploy, here the tags must be configured somewhere. So here I'm now going to change the image to, uh, oops.
Yeah, I'm going to change the image to 0.6 to 0.5. Not positive, it will help. Let's see. Right, so that will bounce off the data trigger service, and we will have uh, the new tag being picked up. That's running already. Great. Trying to do fusion spec apply again. I know that uh, our this thing has worked fine. Let's try that again. Okay, it is running as compared to last time. So there's some problem with the <clears throat> uh, with the 0.6 version. I'll, I'll fix that later. Good, good to spot it. Okay. Oh, oh. It is still having problems connecting to RabbitMQ and the same problem that we had last time. But it's still not restarting. Okay, it did restart. Okay, there you go. Some problem. I believe I need to investigate this a little more. So let's go and watch the video quickly and then I can, you can hit me up on Slack and I'll, I'll show you the later thing how it still has a problem. So what happens is when we invoke the functions, uh, the scale of that data connector part goes from zero to one. And if there are more messages coming in, it can scale out from one to more. And to be clear, in that picture that we talked about, right? Data connector is sitting somewhere here, basically, right? So, sorry, here. There is a message in the message queue, the data connector part goes from zero to one. So in between the topic and the function that needs to be called. And if there are no messages in the topic, this scales back to zero, uh, that is the point. Cool, uh, unfortunately, sorry about that. I couldn't show you the demo. I wish I could have, or I should have done a write run maybe last night, but here we are. Yeah, we're still having problems. So that's where it is. But uh, yep, um, so that demo didn't work out. Let's see what next. Cool, so we are at 12.30. Uh, I would like to take a small four minute break. We'll be back at 12.30. I think what we now cover mostly is contributing to fission and some use cases and some general stuff, mostly theoretical stuff, but also you know, good to know how people are using fission and stuff. Uh, I think we will not need more than 40, 45 minutes to cover both of them together. So we'll be done by like 1.15ish. So let's do a quick three, four minute break and, and let's meet at uh, 12.30, yeah? All right, so, <clears throat> so contributing to fission, uh, how do you contribute? Uh, of course, contributing docs is probably a good way to start. Uh, join the Slack, uh, happy to help, you know, between me, Gaurav, there are a bunch of other folks, a lot of community folks as well uh, do respond. A couple of users, you know, from Japan, uh, India also do, do respond actively pretty. Now, there are three areas I would say. So first thing is if you're an absolute beginner to open source and contributing in general, I would start with Keda connectors. So as I mentioned earlier, Keda connectors are super generic connectors. They don't you know, need you to know about Kubernetes programming, about uh, the general fission programming so much. Uh, it basically you know, follows a certain contract which is documented on the on a Keda connector and you can look at any one sample example. And uh, as long as you follow that interface, that contract as to what environment is variable to pass and what to do, it's a fairly simple uh, thing to write. Today we have about six R connectors. But if you go to Keda website, right? For example, let's see here. There are something called a scalers. And for every scalar in Keda, we can write a connector for fission. So if you can look at it, there are probably what? 40 arc scalers they have. You can write a connector for each of them in the fission Keda connector. And a simple single connector is not too big. If you look at, for example, let's go and look at RabbitMQ, the one that we were just trying to deal with. There's only one like simple Golang file, hardly 200 lines. Could be more, could be less, you know, based on the, the topic. So, you know, you can get fairly easily started and start contributing. You'll get your feet wet and, you know, also, uh, you know, start contributing, right? So that's, that's the easiest place to start, I would say. Uh, <clears throat> so that's, that's perfect for beginners. 
if you're slightly medium uh you know kind of contributor have done a few contributions here and there want to you know level up a little bit environments are another place so environments are nothing but the language specific run times so you can contribute or enhance existing environments or you can bring in new run times like right now we are looking for rust as an example maybe you know and other languages you know and stuff like that so you can contribute there as well the third of course is the core fission uh, it requires some understanding of kubernetes controllers uh, to some degree uh, but even then i would search for, you know for good first issues uh, look at documentation look at blogs and and pick up one of the simplest issues you know from there and if you haven't done any kubernetes programming around you know kubernetes controllers i would start with this book uh, it's a great book by michael hans plus if you follow it cover to cover you would have a pretty good understanding of how to do uh, kubernetes controller you know programming also uh, our folks in india you know like there was a workshop yesterday by nikita and abarun bunch of other folks they do run workshops sometime but i am how to start contributing to kubernetes that's a great workshop as well to learn how to start contributing to you know any kubernetes project or top project on top of kubernetes basically right the fundamental concepts remain same cr controllers you know and all that stuff operators basically but this book is like absolutely the gold standard which you if you want to start learning about contributing to any kubernetes or kubernetes based project like controllers operators and those kind of things basically great so that's about contributing now if you go to fission core uh, let me go to uh, fission core code base and if you want to contribute it's simple uh, there is a tool called scaffold and if you do scaffold run it will actually run like build images locally you push it to you know your repository and then deploy that piece of code onto the cluster that you're targeting right so your workflow will be typically go and change some code in fission code base you know deploy onto kubernetes server and test it out basically right that's as a basic workflow we can come to that in a minute uh, let's see if our uh, demo works and then we can go back to slides again Uh, so that should create a couple of parts still working yep r2f let's see if that works out better this time okay same issue i believe the rabbit mq version i'm using or the sdk i'm using has some problems but this time the error is at a different line i believe oh this is because of previous version of Okay. Okay. I'm not gonna. I think spend more time on this. There is something definitely broken, which was not the case last week. Are we using the right server URL? G S V C. It is arrived in queue. Five six seven two is the port. That looks good. I can removing service cluster local, but that doesn't really help. Same thing. And I believe I did copy the username and password right as well. Check that once more. IRP. <clears throat> yep, and this looks looks good. Yep. Cool. That's okay. Let's skip that for now. We'll fix it later for sure. All right. Any questions on contributing you have, please uh, don't hesitate to drop onto uh, Fish and Slack. Uh, you can find the Fish and Slack here. Uh, onto the community tab in the website and join the Slack from here and you know get help basically. Okay, any questions on contributing so far? Okay, good. Something in chat. 
Uh, Ashivat says, yeah, does writing blog also count as contributions? Absolutely. Uh, you know, happy to, you know, have blogs also. They are probably one of the greatest ways to contribute and easiest ways also to start. So, so definitely happy to, you know, accept those uh, as well. And, and blog uh, is like the blog repo is again on the, on the GitHub, you know, organization at blog.fishno.io and you can definitely contribute there as well. Uh, it is a simple Hugo website and, and uh, yeah, you can write it in Markdown and that's, that's about it. Great. So I can do this demo right now because I think our uh, attempts at making RabbitMQ didn't succeed. So actually let me show you how to build and deploy uh, Fiction maybe. Cool. So we are in the Fiction repo. Let's assume I have made some change, but I haven't right now, but let me still. Oh, I already start Docker on my local machine and I hope that doesn't hang up everything else. Okay, let's come back to it. Uh, hopefully after the Docker starts up, we'll come back to it. Let's cover the rest of the slides. Cool. So now one of the common use cases with functions or any microservice in general is workflows, right? You want to chain things. You want to, you know, thing A happens, that should invoke thing B. Of course, between in between there might be a message queue that invokes things C and D and so on and so forth, right? So the way we looked at that video onto the YouTube, Am I audible still? Sure. Yeah, we shall. Yep. Okay. The machine seems a little. Yeah, so workflows is a very common use case. Uh, we are going to add support for workflows uh, using you know some of the other projects uh, sometime this year for sure. And uh, we do have another project called Fission Workflows, but that is not actively maintained. So Fission Workflows was the way to do workflows a while back, but Fission Workflows is a different project right now and are not actively maintained anymore, basically. Fission is having a hard time. Something has gone wrong. I'm just testing, am I still audible? Yeah, you are. Great. The next is multi-tenancy. A lot of people ask, and actually a lot of people use it that way, is, is that uh, multiple tenants are using the same fission platform and they want isolation between functions or environments and stuff like that. And there are like various myriad of use cases you know, between those combinations. Uh, multi-tenancy does exist today in Fission and actually use, customers do use multi-tenancy, but there is some work to be done. There are some like sharp edges or rough edges, if I have to say, and that is again, you know, something to be picked up in the, in the roadmap in the next, uh, you know, few months we see. Now coming to use cases, let's talk about telecom company. Uh, they are using Fission as a platform for almost year and a half, uh, you know, for their customers. Uh, it's a telecom CSP actually, like a communication service provider, and, and they do provide their software to multiple telecom companies. And what they want is anytime there is an issue in, let's say, one of their servers, right? That creates a new service request in their platform. And instead of routing that service request to a person, it actually goes to a Kafka message queue and from there picked up by a Fission workflow. And the Fission workflow is a fairly complex set of workflows. Uh, and, and based on one function's execution, next step is decided. So it's like a dynamic workflow, if you have to call it that way. And the dynamic workflow they have built uh, using their own custom logic, but the actual units of function execution, they use Fission uh, pretty heavily. And uh, what happens is that function goes and queries the you know, uh, server, looks at the resources, does some you know, basic checks and stuff, gathers all the information. And once the information is gathered, it is run through a simple like a data analytics or ML kind of model. And based on the results of the model or that data analytics you know, uh, uh, result, it actually goes and fixes the server itself, or it invokes a person to you know come and help in basically, right? So think of like a auto healing system where uh, Fission does a bunch of other you know initial diagnostics, gathers information, finds out what is wrong with that server, why CPU is high, and stuff like that, and gives you that information to the human, or tries to fix it on its own if it is confident enough that no, that is a problem basically, right? So this whole entire workflow is built using Fission, and it is being used across multiple telecom companies, uh, you know, in almost you know. Uh, production and then 
semi production environments as well uh, another customer uh, is using it for a web scraping platform so what they do is as a web scraping analyst there is a ui and they enter a bunch of queries and that query translates into hundreds of functions in the background and each of those hundreds of functions you know go and scrape websites go and scrape you know like portals and stuff and gather the result and then that result is gathered and shown in a ui and they've been running it in production for almost 2 years they have been doing almost 1000 requests per minute of fiction functions and and recently we did exercise for them to scale that out to 5000 requests per minute and and they have planned to scale out up to 100k rpm sometime by end of 2021 or early 2022 we scale and when we did this scaling exercise for them last year uh, it threw up a bunch of interesting problems right so uh, they don't have uh, Uh, a prediction of you know when the request will rise from zero to something like two, three, four thousand RPM, right? And that means if you use AWS load balancer in between, it won't scale fast enough. You will need pre-warming, and pre-warming is not a not an option in their case. So we actually had to use a software-defined load balancer like NGINX, you know, and others instead of using AWS load balancer. Uh, the second problem we ran into was Kubernetes wasn't able to uh, spin up you know pods uh, fast enough sometimes, and and that has its own you know challenges basically. Uh, but finally we were able to scale up to 7k rpm in our test environment uh, without uh, you know with some architectural changes and and a success rate of you know close to 97% uh, and above is so that's that's a web scraping platform uh, one of the other world's top 10 firms uh, i believe it also is top 5 right now maybe they are using fission as a backend for a security platform think of it like a low code uh, you know platform so in the ui the security researchers write the security uh code and that goes and gets executed into a bunch of functions which eventually go and call either websites or you know servers to run that execution uh, security code basically uh there are many more uh, so for example like spotify is right now you know evaluating uh, and trying to switch from lambda functions to fission uh, and integrates with sqs and bunch of other you know message queues and stuff there is another telecom company evaluating fission for some of their you know on prem as well as on cloud workloads There's a Japan-based AI startup. They have been using Fission for their ML workloads. There is a Singapore-based data analytics company. They actually run a lot of analytics on Fission functions, and Kafka as the primary, you know, backbone for the message queue. So, you know, that's kind of the brief of the workshop. Uh, and uh, you know, happy to answer any questions. Dive into specific areas. I know we are done ahead of the time, so you know we can probably spend half an hour if there is any specific area you know you want to talk about, discuss, ask questions. Vishal, is there any example for a TypeScript based API? Uh, sorry, what based API? A uh, TypeScript API. Okay. Uh, so right now we don't have like we haven't tried the TypeScript itself. Uh, but TypeScript eventually does connect to JavaScript, uh, right, Nikhil? Yep. So uh, if if you are able to compile it into JS, the Node.js environment should itself work. in fact right now uh, there is an example that we built last to last week uh, that uses next js mm -hmm. uh, not this one sorry. yeah uh, and next js you know like dynamic routing and you know multiple support file support also works uh, with fission now uh, there has been one user who has asked us for typescript a while back but but we haven't looked at it maybe if you find an issue i believe there is already one issue We can try to look at it and you know uh, add support for TypeScript as well. Okay. But as far as you compile outside Fission, it should still work. You know, I, I don't think like it, it is any different than a normal like Node.js server, basically.